a very special day for the uh, free clinic. Uh, before I introduce our guest speaker, I want to introduce someone who's been our guest speaker on two other occasions, uh, a great supporter of this clinic and the community, a wonderful person, United States District Court Judge Otis Wright, who's in the back. <laughs> As you know, we try to bring in speakers from every area of legal specialty. The community faces all kinds of problems, whether it's landlord-tenant, criminal defense. We, we bring prosecutors here to show what ethical and professional and honorable prosecutors are all about. Judges come here to talk about different topics. Uh, every legal specialty, social security, health care, personal injury, whatever it may be, we try to do our best to educate the community on serious legal issues. Our belief is with knowledge comes power, and with power comes an ability to affect your life. Well, today is no exception. It's my great honor and privilege to introduce one of the most powerful and most influential prosecutors in the United States, Jacqueline Jackie Lacey. Jackie is the second in command of the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office. She is Chief Deputy District Attorney. Now, to put that in perspective, I think some of you know that the LA County District Attorney's Office is the largest district attorney's office in the United States. This office has close to a thousand prosecutors. We're bigger than New York, Chicago, Miami, you name it. It's a massive operation. She is second in command and helps run that office. She has occupied every significant position in that office you can have. She was a felony prosecutor for many years. She prosecuted death penalty cases. She prosecuted juvenile cases. She won the first conviction for a race crime in Los Angeles County. She convicted three Nazi lowriders who beat an African-American man to death as part of their membership into the, uh, the gang. Um, and she has been extremely innovative in management. Uh, she has been very instrumental in putting together a special court where veterans who have mental problems can be properly handled. She has put together a special court where women in reentry who are not being charged with a violent crime can deal with drug issues, mental health issues, you name it. She's been instrumental in prosecuting animal cruelty, something she holds dear to her heart, and she knows everything about how to manage this massive operation. She's from Los Angeles, went to Dorsey High School, went to University of California at Irvine and USC Law School. She was a city attorney before she became a district attorney. And uh, with no further ado, I want to introduce our guest speaker, and we're very honored to have her, Jackie Lacey. Well, no pressure with that introduction, right? <laughs> and a federal judge sitting in the audience. Um, I want to uh, thank Tom for uh, allowing me in to uh, come and speak to you today. It is my honor. Uh, as he mentioned, uh, I am the Chief Deputy of the LA County District Attorney's Office, but what's important to you is I'm from here. I'm a girl from here. I'm a girl from here, and that's what you should know. I grew up in the Crenshaw District. I went to Dorsey High School, as Tom mentioned. And one of my first jobs was actually in the city of Inglewood. I worked in City Hall uh, through something called the Summer Youth Employment Program. And my job at the Summer Youth Employment Program was to basically process time cards for all of the employees that uh, you know, were working for the city of Inglewood. And to say it was a less than, than exciting job is an understatement. I, I just want to give you one story. There's a woman who uh, was a bit older than me. She's probably younger than me now, but at the time when I was 18, she was an older woman. I, I'm 54 years old. She probably was in her 40s. And Edna was working right across from me. And as a youth, you know, in your first job, you're always looking around to see how other people are reacting to uh, the job. And Edna would uh, come in late, but about 10 minutes before quitting time, which was 4.30, I noticed Edna would start looking around for her purse. She would comb her hair. She would put her lipstick on. And she would start to put away her stuff. And right at 5 o'clock, Edna, we punched a time clock back then. Some people probably don't know what a time clock is. I know what a time clock is. But um, uh, she would immediately punch out and run out the door down the stairs. And I remember as a young person saying, it's very important for me when I find my career that it be something that I really enjoy. Uh, 
because the last thing I wanted to do was be stuck where Edna was stuck, which is, uh, you know, leaving as soon as you can from an employment. So I decided to listen to what my mother and father said, and I went to college and decided to look for a career, a career that was challenging. And for me, I always knew that I wanted to be working with people and that I wanted to help people. I knew that was something within me and I knew that I needed to find a job that, uh, that, that would do that. And certainly lawyers, as we know from you know, being at this clinic, lawyers do help uh, people. But my first job was in the civil arena and uh, it was a job where all I did was sit through depositions. And if you've ever watched attorneys ask questions, they can be the most boring, repetitive people you have ever met in your life. And I thought to myself, my goodness, I have gone to law school looking for an exciting career, and here I am stuck on the 32nd floor of a Century City law firm, and I want to jump. I am so bored. I have got to get out of this. I have got to get out of here. This can't be it. And so a girlfriend uh, who was working as a prosecutor at the city of Santa Monica said, leave that job, come over and try this. And that job turned out to be the right field for Jackie. It turned out to be the right field for me. There I was, involved with people all day long, victims of crime, witnesses, police officers, judges, defense counsel. It got to the point I was so involved with people and, and some of the people who do trial work will tell you this, when I go home I don't even answer the phone. I, I just don't want to hear anybody talk so I can have that period of time. But for me that turned out to be the right fit for me. I have had, the, the, I feel like the luckiest woman in the world in the sense of I have had uh, the career of my lifetime in the district attorney's office, doing everything from you know, prosecuting low-level offenses to, as, as Tom mentioned, prosecuting some very serious cases. But my last 10 years have been in a leadership position. And the reason, uh, the one thing I want to talk to you about today is we are about a week away from a massive shift in the criminal justice system. We, it is October 1st, which is one week from today. Things will change in the criminal justice system. And most people aren't even aware. Most people even working in the courthouse don't even know about this change. And I'll be speaking three or four times this week to different groups on this change. It's called public safety realignment. And it is one of the biggest change, changes since the enactment of the three strikes law or the reinstatement of the death penalty. The, this, uh, this particular change br was brought about through prison overcrowding. And I have a person who's helping me today by passing out pictures. And these pictures are taken from the US Supreme Court case known as Brown versus Plata. The bottom line is over the past 20 to 30 years, prisons in California had gotten so full they had gotten so overcrowded that they were at about 200% of their design capacity. In other words, let's say it was designed to hold 20,000 people, there were actually 40,000 people in there. And many of these people, as you might suspect, uh, had mental illness and many of them had physical uh, ailments. And Justice Kennedy, who wrote the opinion of Plata, said that things had gotten so crowded, so crowded, that those who were suffering from mental and physical illnesses were not getting the proper treatment. And he did something which I think is brilliant, which is he wrote this lengthy opinion which I've read, but he attached the pictures that you have in front of you. Because he, if anything, he wanted people to know that it wasn't that he was being soft on crime, but that things had gotten so bad. The pictures that you have, there are two pictures you see in a, taken in a gymnasium of a state prison, a couple of state prisons. And the cells themselves had gotten so overcrowded that they were putting 200 prisoners in a gymnasium in bunk beds. And those prisoners might only have two people guarding them. So you can imagine the safety issues there as well as the lack of treatment. But what stopped me cold 
What stopped me cold in looking at this opinion is the photograph you have of cages, two cages, and they are telephone size, telephone booth size cages. These cages were used to house the acutely mentally ill who were suicidal. These cages do not have bathrooms, they're called dry cages, and they were being housed in those cages because, quite frankly, there was no room in the infirmary, there was no place to treat people. And uh, they would be kept there for several days until uh, they could get treatment. The testimony in the case of, of uh, Brown versus Plata came not from the ACLU, came not from the prison rights people, it came from the guards who were working in there under those conditions and watching it and realizing that we were creating such an inhumane environment. Now here's what I'm going to say. I'm a prosecutor, so recently, so you know, I, I, I understand that when you go to prison you're supposed to be punished. Recently I was, I was listening to KMPC, KMPCC or KMPC and they were doing a story on Pelican Bay and uh, there had been complaints about Pelican Bay and a hunger strike and the reporter at the end, the most she could say was, well the inmates aren't getting sunlight so they're a little pale. Well, you know what? I put a couple of murderers in there, so if the, if, the, if the worst you could find is that they were getting a little pale, then I'm good with that, okay? I'm good with that. But what I'm not good with, what I'm not good with, and what we should not be good with as a society, is treating people in this fashion, is warehousing people in this fashion, notwithstanding whatever they did to get in there. And so here we had uh, the overcrowded state prisons and we had this decision where the Supreme Court said you California must release some of these prisoners to, because it is overcrowded and it is so overcrowded that the mentally ill and the physically ill are not being treated humanely. Right around the time that happens Governor Jerry Brown gets elected and as you know, California bu California's budget is suffering. There is no more money. There's no more money to build prisons, and things have to change. And what changed was the enactment of a law called AB 109. AB 109 uh, and uh, public safety realignment are the same things. Now, m the purpose of this talk is to give you sort of facts, because right now, uh, a lot of people on talk radio are panicking and I've heard a lot of people say things that simply aren't true about AB 109. AB 109 does not mean that the prisons are getting ready to open up on October 1st and folks are going to run amok through the street. Okay? If you are listening to that channel, turn it. Okay? You're on the wrong channel. That is not what AB 109 is. AB 109 says, look it, uh, these people are being housed these people have been the responsible of the state. We are going to shift a lot of these non-serious, non-violent, non-sex offender defendants from the state to the county. And county, we want you to handle it. And we want you to figure out how to handle it. And we want you to do it on a third less money than it cost us to handle it. And so what that means, just to give you the reality, Let's say your court case, if you have a criminal case, your court case is Monday and you're charged with, say, embezzlement on Monday, the 26th, uh, and the judge says, you know what, I'm sentencing you to state prison for, let's say, six, three years, for three years, the maximum. You will go off to state prison. One Monday from that, if a case comes up that's identical to yours, the judge will say, I'm sentencing you to three years in state prison but you will go to the county jail. You will go to the LA County Jail. And, and this is sort of the interesting twist on this. People know that the LA County Jail is extremely crowded. There's a decision called Rutherford that was, back in, that was issued back in 1975 about the, the uh, county jail system. Uh, so the county jails are already crowded. They're already crowded. They've got, you know, the folks that are in there for misdemeanors. They've got folks awaiting their cases to be heard. And so what's going to happen is that the sheriff's department is going to take a look 
at the person who is sentenced to state prison in the county jail. And the sheriff's department is going to look for an alternative means to deal with that person. Some people will stay in jail, but many people are going to be released once they get into jail, either on electronic monitoring or ankle bracelets, as you well know. Um, we're calling them, uh, what is the latest starlet who, has an, who had an ankle bracelet? Uh, Lindsay Lohan bracelets. Some people will be released on Lindsay Lohan bracelets. Some people will be released into treatment programs operated by the community and by faith-based organizations. And uh, some people will just be placed on probation. In addition, in addition, a lot of, uh, many of these, if you're, if you're uh, on, if you're set to be released on parole or probation and your current case, you're in prison today, in your current case, you're set to be released, say, October 15th. Your current case is a non-serious, non-violent. You're not going to be reporting to a parole officer for one year. You're going to be uh, reporting to probation. And rather than be on parole for one year, you'll be on probation. Uh, and uh, you will be on probation probably for a short period of time, especially if you are successfully doing well. There are a lot more changes to that, but those are the basics. The state, what was happening with the state will now be the county's responsibility. And so, here's, here's the challenge. Here's, here's the challenge. The challenge for those of us who are in the public safety business, and I include judges in that, uh, prosecutors and defense attorneys who, who certainly care about our society is how will we keep our priorities straight in light of this seismic change? Because you see, all of us want to be safe. Even though they talk about crime is down from uh, that, you know, as low as it's been in 60 years, there's still an element out there that not everybody feels safe. I, I can recall in the 70s, being a kid at Dorsey High School, my mother's here and she'll tell you, I walked to school. And back then, uh, the, the Crips and the Bloods were in full-blown activity. And I can recall walking to school, seeing graffiti out there on the buildings. I can recall worrying. I can recall my mother saying, you are not going to a party on Nicolette or in the jungle. They call it, they call it something else now. Uh, I can recall, I can recall very vividly a kid by the name of Robert Ballou being shot at the Palladium, which is, uh, I believe Palladium's still open, over his leather coat. And I can recall being a kid and being afraid. Being afraid. And sometimes you're there, you're in a state of fear for so long, you don't even realize that there's anything better, that there's a different kind of life. And so it is the prosecutor's responsibility to make sure that we live in a safe environment, but also that justice is fair. And I don't know about those of you who have been in the, in the justice system, how, whatever you do for 25 years, you're tired of seeing that revolving door. People coming in, going out, people coming in, going out. And you start thinking to yourself, is there a better way? Is there a different way? I've had the privilege of being part of what's called the alternative sentencing program or movement in the criminal justice system. Alternative sentencing. Sometimes it's called collaborative justice. Sometimes it's called, um, uh, the term escapes me, uh, restorative justice. But what these things are is saying, rather than send you to incarceration first, how about we do this? How about if drug addiction is your problem, how about we treat that? See if, we, see if that can solve this problem and keep you out of custody. What about if your problem is mental illness? And I thank um, God for Ron Artest, and I don't use the Lord's name in vain, but I thank God for Ron Artest's comment when the Lakers won the championship the last time when he said, I want to thank my psychiatrist. And I thank God for that because there is a lot of people who wouldn't get treatment if they didn't know other people were suffering from that. I am so convinced that so many of us are either suffering from mental illness or know someone who is suffering from mental illness that is undiagnosed and untreated. And in the criminal justice system, never is it more prominent, never is it more on display. And the difference between someone being able to lead a productive life is getting the treatment and therapy that they desperately need. Sometimes in the criminal justice system, you have to look at a situation and not punish people for mental illness. It is not their fault.
It is not their fault at times. And you have to be courageous enough, courageous enough to ignore the voices that saying, oh, you're just being soft on crime or people are faking this or whatever, to say, no, 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 we're going to do something different. So I've been a part of the team that has created uh, several programs, three of them I'm going to tell you about that are very important, that are very successful in saving money for the county of Los Angeles. One is the Mental Health Co-Occurring Disorders Court in which people are placed on probation and they get drug treatment and they also get treatment for their mental illness. The other is the Veterans Court. We're, we're finding that people are accepting the fact that veterans are coming back from these 10 years of war and they are suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. And in, uh, I remember the day I decided this is what we're going to do in the DA's office, I went to a program called New Directions, which is in uh, West LA. And I looked, this was the cleanest drug program uh, treatment center I'd ever seen in my life. There were doctors available, and here there were a bunch of empty beds. And there were empty beds because no one had gotten the veterans who needed this help into those beds. And so we made a, a decision about a year ago to do that. And that is a very successful program that, quite frankly, I would like to see expanded. But our most successful program, our most successful program has been with women because we have found that women really respond well. Really, women really respond well to rehabilitative efforts. And there is a program called Women's Reentry Court. It's called Second Chance Women's Reentry Court. It is located out in Pomona. It's run by a group called Prototypes. And what we do with women, especially women who are moms, especially women who have children, is we give them an opportunity to live in an environment where they get the support and knowledge that they need to be, to not be dysfunctional parents. They get the support. And I've gone out to see this place that is working and is saving money. And what happens is these people are retaught parenting skills. They're retaught and it's reinforced by their peers. And they have a safe environment to raise their kids. They have a safe place. And they're supported and they're given job training. Because let's face it, AB 109 is only half the story in terms of if we, if we see crime increase. If there aren't really jobs out there for people, then you are going to see crimes increase. So that part has to be solved too, and I'm depending on my president here to come through on that one. <laughs> because I'm do, we're going to do our part. But these are things, these are things, here's what you need to know about the three courts that I just talked to you about. Only one judge in the entire county administers those programs. Only one judge. We are 10.3 million people in this county. Only one judge administers that program. That's Judge Mike Tynan. We need to start looking at those programs and expand them. And maybe we need to expand the criteria so that we can get more people into those programs. Because there really is no room at the end to continue to incarcerate people the way we've been doing it over the last 30 years. Many prosecutors are afraid to speak openly about these things because you are thought of, quite frankly, by the old world or the old school as soft on crime. Uh, I thought our Attorney General did a marvelous job in, in really being very courageous on saying, now we've got to look at some different things here. Let's look at some prevention. Uh, our office, too, has been very courageous in that. We don't publicize it, but I'm here to publicize it and tell you about it because I think it's a good thing that we do. I am uh, very excited about and grateful to talk to you today. I, I also want to thank uh, Mr. Uh, Mesereau, Tom Mesereau, for running this clinic. I was so very impressed. I'd heard about this place for quite some time. And uh, I know, because if you're a lawyer, you, even no matter what kind of law you get, you get phone calls all time and day and night about, can you help me with my will? Can you help me? Somebody's taken money from me. Can you help me with this? And it's really hard to sort of say to people, that's not my area of law or I can't help you. And so it's good that you have, this is a jewel. You have a place like this. Uh, and uh, he is to be commended for this. But I want to tell you that we are facing a tremendous change. And it's important that we start working together to make sure that LA County remains safe. Uh, prison overcrowding is a challenge, and AB 109 will be a tremendous challenge for prosecutors in the future. But I do think it's time to look at the complexities that cause crime and deal with those. I want to thank you for allowing me to come speak today, and, and also I want to acknowledge I have a couple of people in the audience who are very special to me. Uh, my mother is here, and my sister. Would you all raise your hands? They're here to support me. Um, 
I, I, I also have a special young man with me here today. I hate uh, driving around a lot, and he's my volunteer driver. His name is Jason Brown, and you know him. Maybe you know his father from this community. Jason Brown's father was Rosie Brown, who was a peace officer here in Inglewood. Uh, for quite some time, and he left to become an actor, and he appears in quite, uh, he has appeared in quite a few movies. He is uh, deceased, but uh, Jason is uh, volunteering to help me out here, and he's been my driver today, and he's here t uh, this morning. Please give me a hand. Raise your hand. Um, I thought I would open it up to questions today, and they don't really need to be about AB 109. Certainly they can be any questions you might have about the justice system. I'm your chief deputy. I'm accountable to you. And so if there are questions in general, not specific cases, please, <laughs> but questions in general that you might have about the justice system. Yes? Um, so with these changes, what effects, if any, do you think um, they'll have on the juvenile system, and do you think there'll be a shift in the number of minors tried as adults in LA? I, I, I would certainly hope not, because then we would be working against ourselves if we start trying more minors as adults. Uh, I, we're not sure. That's the honest answer, because we haven't started looking at the juvenile court system to see what the changes are. I will tell you with the non serious, non violent felons, if you have a strike, then you go to state prison. You won't be housed locally here at county. But if your strike is a juvenile strike, something you got as an adult, you will be housed locally here in the county. And so there is a movement. I, I think with juvenile crime too, we've got to get skin in the game very, very early. Very, very early. We, it's too late almost by the time they get to juvenile hall. And so I advocate every adult who's like me, whose children are now grown. I have a daughter who turned 28 today and a son who's 30. Uh, you got a little bit of time and a little bit of experience that you probably could donate in a school uh, to mentor other kids who need your help. And so I think as professionals, we really owe it to kids to get very involved early on to tell them, no, that's not the right way uh, to do it. Yes, somebody over here. Uh, it'll be tough, you know, I will tell you this, it is, um, um, it, will, it will be very tough. We're going to be relying heavily on community-based and faith-based organizations. Matter of fact, that is written into the law that the sheriff can, in fact, release them to some community-based and faith-based organizations. Uh, the district attorney's office does not you know, create jobs other than in the office, obviously, and we'll be hiring more people as a result of this because we expect the criminal justice traffic to uh, uh, pick up. But I think that uh, just like we have a women's reentry court, I would sure love to see that for men. I think there's a, there's a uh, population of men uh, that uh, could certainly benefit from that. And uh, I, although the way the system is set up now, the sheriff determines who goes where, I would like to see prosecutors and defense attorneys and more importantly judges involved in placing people in the right place at the front end as opposed to letting, just sentencing them to state, to, uh, state prison, letting them go into the jail and letting the, the sheriff determine that. I think uh, very strongly that judges with the help of the attorneys involved in the case are really the most qualified to make that determination. But I, I would like to see a men's reentry court. Yes, ma'am. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for bringing this information to us. Thank you. Uh, but my question is, what effect, if any, will this law have on those who are serving life without sentence? Um, the the, the uh, answer is not much. With regard to violent crime, with regard to people who are uh, committed on violent crime, they'll still they'll still be they they, they will still be serving state prison sentences for life. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Hi. Hi. I wanted to know: Is there any, maybe similar to her question? Are there any provisions in AB 109 regarding the death penalty? No, no, there are not. It was uh, strictly designed to um, address non-serious, non-violent. Uh, and non-sex crimes in order to get that through. Um, I do feel, just as a casual observer of the criminal justice system, that um, we will probably be discussing the death penalty next year. I wouldn't be surprised if I saw something on the ballot 
uh, about that, especially in light of the execution that just occurred. And I know in Sacramento there is um, a legislator who uh, who is trying to get a moratorium on the death penalty. So I, I just wouldn't be surprised. And given, the, you know, given that in California it's so expensive to, um, to do death penalty appeals, uh, and uh, that we have, a, I believe, about 700 people on death row, I wouldn't be surprised if that comes up. Any, yes? Thanks again for being here. Thank you. Has more thought been given to giving releasing more people who are terminally ill? They should. They certainly should. Um, in addition to the suggestions that I talked about, there, there is a pool of suggestions floating out there about uh, what else can we do. And, and certainly those who are terminally ill or very ill, who, you know, there's this, there are people in the state prison who are in their 70s who are very sick. And certainly if you're, talk, if you're talking about just even saving money, that would make uh, a lot more sense than keeping people in and treating them at that level. I, I just think it's, it's going to be something, whether, it, it'll be what we decide as voters, what we decide as, as a public, as the public, uh, whether we can do that or not. Uh, but uh, I know it's being discussed. It certainly was on a list of suggestions that our office came up with uh, to send to the governor. What we will see. But there is definitely a huge change afoot. Any other questions? Yes. Jackie, we have some wonderful volunteer law students, college students, and lawyers who come to our clinic, and, and they're just wonderful, wonderful people how they spend their time helping others. Uh, would you please uh, let them know why you chose to be a prosecutor? Yes, yes. Um, <clears throat> I came from a strict household. <laughs> I'm sorry, I shouldn't, I shouldn't joke like that. Um, especially not. Um, you know, it's funny, the first time I interviewed with a guy by the name of Mike Myers, who was the city attorney of Santa Monica, he put it a little bit more bluntly, Tom. He said, why would a black person want to be a prosecutor? And I remember thinking, I need this job. I don't want to go back to doing, uh, you know, depositions on the 32nd floor. And yet I'm a little offended, you know, that people assume uh, because of the color of my skin that I wouldn't be uh, interested in seeing a peaceful and just society. Um, being a prosecutor means uh, that uh, you are in charge of performing your job in an ethical manner. And I think that by virtue of the fact that I came from this very community, I'm just as qualified as, as anybody else to determine what is justice. What is that like? And I have at times dismissed cases and reduced them because I felt that the evidence just wasn't there. I have a perspective that is a little different, and that is that, quite frankly, I've seen it. Anybody is capable of not telling the truth, including peace officers as well as witnesses. And so I challenge the evidence a little bit stronger. Now, don't get me wrong. When I think you did it, when I think you did it, uh, as in the, the uh, sexual molestation uh, trial that I had where a man was basically, African American man was basically going around kidnapping young girls off the street and molesting them, it's on. And it should be on. It should be on. On the other hand, I also believe big time in redemption. Uh, I believe that not all people who come to the criminal justice system are created equal. And I am honored uh, to be entrusted with this very important mission. Uh, I, you know, listen, I, I struggle getting up on Monday mornings just like anybody else. Uh, but once I am there, I find my job challenging. I find that it is a way to help people. I find that uh, the subject matter is extremely interesting. Uh, and uh, I believe that I was born to do that. Now, it's not for everybody. If you can't multitask, if you can't operate on the fly, do, if you're nervous about speaking in front of people, do not come and become a trial lawyer with our office because that will be your everyday job. But if you enjoy uh, making sure that the right thing is done, if you enjoy uh, seeking justice for those who have been wronged, who have been wrong. If you enjoy arguing and convincing people that you are right, then this is the best job for you. 
it is the best job for you. And uh, I'm very proud. I've, I've been there, like I said, most of my adult life, uh, 26 years. And uh, it's a great job. And I hear that from everybody. I hear that from everybody who works there, that, uh, that they enjoy it. Anybody else? Yes. Um, how strong do you feel about the election coming which, which election? There's so many elections. Tell me. I have more like the propositions and um, the elections. Uh, I think 2012 will be a fascinating election year. For those people who are political junkies, you will be on the internet 24-7. Redistricting has pitted long-term friends against one another. It is pitting races against one another. Uh, the president has a compelling, interesting story. No one knows how it will play out. The Republican Party has an interesting story or byline um, in this county. There's an interesting race for district attorney because the current DA is going to retire. And so for the first time in many, many years, it might be 35 years, an incumbent will not uh, be running. And who gets in matters. Who gets in matters. And who gets these jobs matters. And so it will be very important for the public to look at that. We may, I, I alluded to the fact that the death penalty may get on the uh, ballot this year. Marijuana may come on the ballot next year. And uh, it'll be interesting seeing how baby boomers who grew up in, shall we say, marijuana-filled college campuses, how they vote on that, you know, how they vote on it. What, what will they do? What will they say? Uh, so I will be, in my family, this is what we do when we start talking about propositions. Um, it's my job to read all the propositions and then we sit down and we have Chinese food brought in and everybody comes with their ballot and we go down and I say, here are the pros, here are the cons, how do you vote? We take a vote, we argue, and then everybody does what they want to do because your family doesn't listen to you, right? <laughs> so, uh, so that's how we do it. But read, I think we need to read. So many bad laws have been passed because voters haven't read. Even AB 109, AB 109 has been corrected four or five times because your legislators didn't read it the first time and didn't see some of the unintended consequences. And so they've amended it four or five times. And even in January, we're hoping to amend it again because there's a couple of other things they forgot to put in there. But read, read. And I, I, that's what I would say. Read and make up your mind. Yes. Tom? Jackie, I, when I introduced you, I neglected to mention that you travel to East Los Angeles once a week and you tutor grammar school kids on gangs and bullying and drugs and, I do. and things like that. And I, I gather you're involved in a moot court program? Uh, I am, yes. When I say skin in the game, I tell you that from personal experience. Five years ago, I raised my hand to volunteer for something that I didn't even realize I was volunteering for. Uh, once, a, once a week. I go to Lorena Street Middle School, or elementary school. They're fifth graders, and they're about to go into middle school. And uh, we have a preset curriculum in the DA's office. We talk to them about drugs, gangs, bullying, animal cruelty. Uh, we talk to them about why it's important to go to school and get a really good career. Uh, we take them on a tour of juvenile hall and we lock them in the cell. You know what I mean? And we leave them there for about 20 good minutes. And then we show them those public toilets that they're going to, and their showers. And we have the probation officer have them walk in a line just like they do in juvenile hall with their hands behind their back. And we say, look it, here's your reality. You got a choice here. You could end up, you go to middle school next year, there'll be some knucklehead telling you, join a gang, use drugs. This is where you're going to end up. And uh, it is a, a, a very life-changing experience. I've been doing that for five years. And not just life-changing for them, but for me. Because in my day, there's a lot of frustration. But when I leave and I go to that school and I feel like I am making a difference, the kids, have you ever dealt with fifth grade kids? They are so loving. It's right before they, th it's right before they think they know everything. And so I get love notes. I get hugs. You know, I get little things, little pencils. And, and so that, you know, that kind of feedback uh, feeds my soul. You know what I mean? It just feeds my soul. It reminds me that, you know, whatever argument I'm having with a colleague or whatever frustration, there is a little person here that matters. Uh, we also take them to the Museum of Tolerance. And at the very end, we do a play in the courthouse. 
and uh, they get to play. They get chosen for the play. Everybody wants to be the judge. How about that, Judge, <laughs> judge Wright? Everybody wants to be that judge. Uh, but they get to play prosecutors. We have a defense team. We have a set of jurors. We have a defendant. We have witnesses. And they really get into it. And we do that mock trial at the very end. We bring them down to the big old criminal courts building. And uh, they learn about what a trial is. And uh, those are the kinds of programs that I was talking about when I talk about juvenile justice that it's just good to get in before, before kids get wrapped up in that, in that system. And we're very proud of it. And I'm, I'm, I'm very honored. Thank you very much, Tom. Would you be interested in doing a program like that at King Drew High School? We, I certainly could. We ha we're in 60 schools, so I'm surprised we're not at King We may be at King Drew. We may be, but I'll check. We're in 60. The, I'm not the only prosecutor. I'm the highest ranking prosecutor that does it, but I'm not the only prosecutor that does it. Uh, but we are in, we've increased from 30 to 60 schools. It is easy to get on our list. Uh, and, uh, but we do, we have found, because we tried going a little bit older than fifth grade, fifth grade really is the right age. Fifth grade is the, is the really right age. So uh, I'd sure be, be happy to look into that for you. Thank you. Uh -huh. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Well, immigration, um, you know, that's a tough issue. In this country, uh, or certainly in California, there is a significant population of people that are in the state prison and county jail system that are in this country illegally. Um, my position is, I always look at that as a separate uh, issue. Uh, you, uh, you commit a crime in this country, you go to jail whether you're a citizen or, or not. There are some that feel that uh, you, know, you ought to deport people. I, I leave that up to the federal government. I feel like that's their job to do, to take care of. But as far as I know from reading it, and I tell you this, AB 109 is so thick and keeps getting amended. We have a team of attorneys that goes through it, and they print out you know, summaries for uh, us. I know of no immigration um, no issue to address uh, immigration at all in AB 109. Okay. All right. Anything else? Yes. Um, the program that you are with is this based off of the um, program that was implemented and opened by Kamala Harris? Are you talking about uh, the 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 chi the uh, in in uh, schools? Yes. Uh, no, we've actually had the DA's office in LA has had this program. It's called Project LEAD, and it's been in existence, I want to say, 15 years. It was designed, the curriculum was designed by the Constitutional Rights Foundation. And so we've been doing that uh, for quite some time. Like, like I said, a lot of these things aren't publicized, and they should be publicized more. Uh, but uh, yeah, we've been doing this for quite some time. And we're going to put it on the internet so other people and other, other prosecutors' uh, offices throughout the United States can do the same thing as well as um, maybe other countries have expressed, other countries have expressed interest in it. Uh, but um, uh, we also have a truancy program, try to get people to send their kids to school. Uh, believe it or not, there are people who just don't <laughs> Uh, send their children to school and uh, we try to combat that also by giving people encouragement because it's actually illegal to keep your kids out of school and some people do um, so we do try to encourage uh, people to send their children to school because we think that's the best place for them. Yes? How does AB 109 operate with the three strikes law for offenders that are in prison on nonviolent multiple strikes? Right. Uh, unfortunately, strikes disqualify you from being housed at the county level. Um, in LA County, you know that the district attorney made a policy decision 10 years ago that we would not send people to prison for life on those third strikes if they're non-serious, non-violent. Uh, some, they still do come, uh, go to prison. You know, that might be the next step. But I think this was an easier, um, it was an easier sell for the governor to sell the legislature non-serious, non-violent, non-sex. And so that may be the, the next step. All right. Well, Tom? Can I do one thing by May? You've been in management for approximately 10 years, I believe. I have. At the district attorney's office. Yes. 
And could you just tell people here some of the things you have to deal with in managing that kind of an operation? Yes. Um, all right, here's what I'll tell you about my management experience. I had none when I got into it. I found out I was going to be a director on the, on the train. I was coming into work one day and somebody said, congratulations. And uh, the word leaked out that I was going to be a manager. I had no management training. I made a whole lot of mistakes that first year, uh, but then I got smart and started reading books and going to classes to learn how to lead. Because one thing to be a trial lawyer, it's a different thing to actually uh, lead trial lawyers. Lawyers are uh, a complicated group, as you can imagine. You know what I mean? In the sense that you don't really tell them what to do. You've got to encourage them. And you encourage them by leading by example and by setting high ethical standards and telling them what uh, you expect. Uh, we have, when we're at top speed, we have a thousand lawyers. Uh, they range from experience from five years to 35 years. And as a, in a leadership position, what I do on a regular basis is um, I approve performance evaluations. I help to make decisions about the budget. Uh, I, um, uh, at times, have had to thank and excuse people, or another nice way of saying fire people for misconduct, for committing crimes or uh, other uh, things that need to be done. Uh, I manage staffing. In other words, we, have, we don't have just the one office. We have 30 offices, and we have to make sure that they're properly staffed so that justice is adequately served in Compton as it is in uh, our airport office. Um, you know, I draft policy. Uh, just recently, I made it mandatory uh, that all of our lawyers go through ethics training which, uh, and learn Brady. Brady is a law that says if you're a prosecutor and you're holding evidence that could exonerate a defendant, you got to give that over. And so we made that mandatory. Uh, it is a very challenging job. Uh, right now we're in the midst of a trial from uh, not as bad as OJ, but uh, Tom is sort of connected to it. We're trying Dr. Murray. And uh, we're constantly monitoring how that case is going, uh, making sure that uh, we have the adequate resources uh, to try that case and making sure the prosecutor is well supported. Uh, we get calls from the media all the time. Uh, people watch what happens in our office because we are the largest office. Uh, at any given time, you know, something could happen and uh, all of a sudden the media spotlight is, is on us and we have to be accountable to the public. We have a public integrity unit. You won't believe this, but sometimes politicians commit crimes. <laughs> And uh, we are constantly monitoring those uh, cases uh, to see that they are adequately provable. Uh, there are so many things that occur in a day, it's really hard to define everything that goes on. But in general, it's my job every morning to make sure that things are running as they should be in that office. And I'm very proud to, to serve in this leadership position. Any more questions? All right. Well, All right. Let's hear it for Jackie Lacey. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Appreciate that. Uh -huh. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Are you available to talk to some? I am. Uh, Jackie's willing to talk to some individuals who might. Uh, now, we can't talk about cases, okay? <laughs> that's, uh, that's off limits. You, you come here and we talk to volunteer attorneys about that. And she is in a prosecuting office, so she can't talk about anything along those lines. But if you want to talk to her about her career and her goals or uh, things like that, uh, this is the opportunity. She's really came and, and volunteered her time to us, and we're very, very blessed. Okay? All right, thank you.